Thank you, Sue, and thank you everyone for joining us. We are gonna be speaking about nutritional support for the aging brain. And just a reminder, now is a family owned business with the largest independent company in the natural products industry and proud of that. With a mission to provide value in products and services that empower people to lead healthier lives. So with that, let's get into the topic. First of all, there is a connection between the brain and the body, obviously, because the brain controls many things in our bodies. So I reviewed some of the expert opinions on what happens to the brain as we age. So these are opinions from authorities rather than product claims, just a reminder. So the National Institute on Aging at the National Institutes of Health reports that our brains are expected to change with age, that parts of the brain can shrink and changes can occur in the neurons and neurotransmitters that are the communications media of the brain and the body. And blood flow can be reduced as arteries narrow and new capillaries do not tend to grow as robustly as in the past. Some people develop plaques and tangles. These are not the amounts and the nature of the ones in Alzheimer's disease, and they're much smaller amounts and they're preliminary changes to the brain, but uh, they might be considered risky for maintaining brain function as we age. And we're looking at damage by free radicals and inflammation can potentially increase if we're not supplying the right nutrients and chemicals that the body needs to maintain protection against these challenges, which you know are really day-to-day -day challenges. We have free radicals just from breathing and regular metabolism. Inflammation is a normal tool of the immune system and the repair system of the body. So these are things that are occurring every day. And you know, even if you do exercise, walking around or running or going to the gym, there's some inflammatory and oxidative challenges in the muscles that have to be addressed as well. So we're constantly exposed to these types of compounds and need to have means to deal with them, natural means preferably. But uh, from the University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Center, they point out that they don't believe that major declines in mental abilities are inevitable as we age, that there's adaptive or plastic in the sense of being adaptable capabilities of the brain as we age. So we all have heard of people who are aging and even over 100 years old and still have their brain capabilities. So what are the other factors involved besides aging, lifestyle, their health status, the environment, genetic uh, influences? These are all things that are factors and interact and are individual for each person. So when we're looking at foods and nutrients and the aging brain, again, these are expert opinions. Some experts will recommend avoid highly processed foods with added chemicals. So we're looking at processed meats and cheeses, white foods, uh, these processed foods from white flour, white rice, white sugar, for example, and foods containing added chemicals like diacetyl or nitrates, for example, some margarine, some microwave popcorn, some beers, might have these chemicals added where others do not. So obviously we're gonna be looking for the natural and organic versions whenever possible, looking for the whole grain products whenever possible, even if we're on gluten-free diets, and looking for less processed cheeses and meats because we wanna avoid these chemicals to preserve our memory. Now, Harvard Medical School has a Health Watch newsletter, and they suggest that diet can help or harm cognitive fitness. 
they are concerned specifically about high cholesterol diets and high fat diets, risking building up cholesterol in the blood vessels within the brain. Now, we typically are going to make much of the cholesterol in our bodies rather than dietary cholesterol being a huge risk factor. Uh, the liver can spit out cholesterol and manufacture it at will and will do so under circumstances that it thinks it needs it. For example, one theory is that a lack of antioxidants in the di diet and in the body make the body create more cholesterol. That cholesterol is also used to ferry nutrients around the body, so carrying vitamin E or things like that might be something that cholesterol is used for. And it does have functions in the body. It's not just a negative thing. You want it to be within range, within balance for healthy levels. And uh, they specifically point out a study that women who ate the most saturated fats from red meat, butter type foods, performed worse on tests of thinking and memory than women who ate less of these saturated fats. So that's the rationale for recommending against those fats. They also point out the Mediterranean diet being healthy, and I'm sure everyone's heard this. And the reason why is because it contains produce, whole grains, fish, and olive oil, which are all considered healthy for the heart and blood vessels. Foods high in omega-3 fatty acids are linked to lower levels of beta amyloid proteins in the blood. Beta amyloid proteins are undesirable in high levels, certainly. And omega-3 tends to lead to better vascular health. There's other benefits as well that they're not mentioning, we'll talk about later. Moderate alcohol consumption, raising levels of healthy high-density lipoprotein or HDL cholesterol. This is the good cholesterol or what Dr. Oz would call happy cholesterol. So how much is moderate consumption? That's considered to be one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men would be the maximum. And a drink would be one can of beer or one shot of hard alcohol. That's considered to be one serving. Uh, they're also claiming that alcohol lowers our cell re resistance to insulin allowing it to move sugar from the bloodstream into cells more efficiently, lowering insulin resistance, improving insulin sensitivity, two different ways to look at the same thing. So these are some of the suggestions from Harvard. And they also point out that it's not only diet, keeping the brain sharp, control cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, use diet, exercise, and medications as needed quit smoking, get some exercise, and keep your body mass index, your, your weight and body composition within a healthy range. Between 18.5 and 24.9 is considered normal for body mass index, so a range between roughly 18 and 25. Now, when we look at other organizations and experts and the foods they recommend, we're gonna see a few of these, and please look for similarities. Foods that help boost memory for seniors and the rest of us would include leafy green vegetables, salmon and other cold water fish as a source of omega-3 fatty acids, berries and dark skin fruits as a source of antioxidants and other polyphenols and things like that that are free radical fighters, coffee and chocolates partially because of their polyphenol contents, extra virgin olive oil because of their fatty acids and cold pressed virgin coconut oil, which is the common organic coconut oil that is sold by now and many other companies uh, as a, a health food, something good for the brain. And we'll talk more about coconut oil in a few minutes. WebMD lists their foods for healthier brain, eat smart for healthier brain. Here's berries, Omega-3 from fish, nuts and seeds, and it's the fat, so it doesn't matter if they're raw or roasted nuts. The fat from the nuts themselves are the important thing. Avocados, whole grains, beans to help regulate blood sugar, 
pomegranates for its polyphenol and antioxidant-like effects. Dark chocolate, which contains the polyphenols and a mild stimulants. And tea, which contains a mild stimulant, caffeine, of course, and antioxidants or free radical fighters. The term antioxidants is used a lot in scientific and medical literature, but on supplements, it typically refers only to vitamins and minerals in the formulas. So we're gonna see a little bit of disconnect between what the experts are recommending, what the studies say, and the actual label claims because of that regulatory restriction. Now, BBC Good Food lists 10 foods to boost your brain power. Again, whole grains, again, oily fish, again, berries. They're suggesting tomatoes, probably because of the vitamin C, vitamin A, and lycopene, the red pigment in most tomatoes. Add vitality with vitamins. They're pointing out the B6, B12, and folic acid. I'm gonna explore that a little more on another slide. Black currants, more fruits, pumpkin seeds, more seeds, broccoli, green vegetable, cruciferous, sage, a spice, and eat more nuts. And the nuts with their healthy oils have come back again on this list. The dietitians from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics have four types of foods to help boost your memory, strength and recall by adding these foods, Eat your veggies, especially cruciferous, berries and cherries, omega-3, which they suggest may help improve memory in healthy young adults, and work in walnuts for working memory. And walnuts are another source of omega-3. There's kind of a duplication there, but we often see that on these lists. Now, Dr. Andrew Weil, MD, who... Uh, most of you are probably familiar with as an author and a commentator. He points out the proper ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids is important, and the ideal is somewhere between 3 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3, or at the high end, 5 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Now, in the American diet, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, the ratio is estimated to be somewhere around 18 to 1, way off track from the 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 range that is considered healthy. Now, Scientific American has asked, is coconut oil good for brain health? And coconut oil, we hear a lot about uh, on the internet and bloggers and uh, self-styled experts on the internet. And the argument is that coconut oil is rich in medium chain triglycerides, MCTs, that are metabolized differently. They can break down into ketones, which the brain uses as a fuel. So giving extra fuel to the brain is considered healthy. Now, if you're talking, talking about just coconut oil and the MCT content, you're looking at somewhere in the mid-teens in terms of percentage of MCT. Somewhere between, say, 12 and 17% MCT oil would be a normal range for what is contained for these fatty acids in MCT oil. Uh, the MCT oil fraction of, of coconut oil, I should say. So there, there's a study suggesting that Alternate energy sources can protect neurons and neur neuronal metabolism. In other words, our communication system, our electrical system in the body that's communicating can use ketones from MCTs as an alternate source of energy. So the brain normally likes to burn sugar. If you're cutting your sugar and your carbs from your diet, where is the brain getting its energy? One source can be turning certain fatty acids from MCT oil into ketones and using that for energy. Another way to get energy is to break down muscle, catabolize muscle, and tear it apart and use some of the amino acids like glutamine for a fuel, for an alternate fuel. So 
You can burn some of these amino acids, but you're robbing the muscle. That's probably not a good strategy if there's ways to do that with sugar, carbs, or fats. So in this randomized controlled trial, intake of MCT oil increases serum ketone bodies, which seems to improve memory. The placebo canola oil did not show improvements. So this supports that improvement in memory through supplementation, even in healthy subjects, especially if you have the brain energy reduced because you're on a low carb diet, a low sugar diet. Now I'll mention the canola oil is used because that's one of the healthiest oils, assuming it's non-GMO, I would add, because it's one of the highest oils in monounsaturates. It actually tests better than olive oil in cardiovascular health studies. I've seen a couple studies directly comparing canola and olive oil, canola coming out on top for cardiovascular health. So here we're seeing another potential use, but uh, certainly MCT oil works better on the brain than canola oil. And here at Oxford University, they did a human clinical trial with three B vitamins, vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid versus placebo, 24 months, and the group that did not take B vitamins lost more brain tissue than the ones that took the B vitamins. This is believed to be related to controlling and keeping within the healthy normal range a substance called homocysteine, which will normally be controlled by having adequate intake of these vitamins. And homocysteine will be elevated beyond normal if you are deficient in the vitamins. So making sure you're getting these vitamins, they're in all B complexes, they're in all multivitamins virtually, or you can take specific supplements that have B6, B12, and folate, or folic acid, uh, as a homocysteine regulating formula, helping the body maintain normal levels of homocysteine as it's supposed to do when it's healthy. And because of this research, organizations are recommending people over 50 take a neuroprotective supplement, which is defined as containing those three B vitamins, B6, B12, and folic acid, which again, take your multivitamin, that'll do it. So let's look at specific nutritional support for the brain. And we mentioned a few minutes ago, omega-3 fatty acids. And the omega-3 fats are essential fatty acids. They have to be obtained from the diet. We cannot synthesize them in our bodies. That is not true for all fats. We can synthesize oleic acid, omega-9 fatty acid in our body, which is the predominant pathway for when we eat stearic acid, which is one of the most abundant saturated fats in the diet represents roughly a third of the, the fat in red meat or cocoa butter, for example. It's in virtually every fat. It's in coconut oil. It's in fish oil. It's in every healthy fat in, on earth contains some stearic acid. And the body tends to use that to make oleic acid. So it's actually either neutral or, or beneficial for cardiovascular health the stearic acid fraction of fats that we eat. So that's an example of a non-essential fatty acid because we can synthesize that in our bodies. But omega-3 fatty acids are essential because they cannot be synthesized in our bodies. They have to be obtained from food or supplements. You can get them from plants. That's a C18, a carbon 18, ALA, and it has to be converted for use by the body into the carbon 20 chain EPA or the 22 chain DHA. So there's an elongation of these. These are long chain fatty acids that are healthy. Now, ALA from plants is poorly converted. First of all, there's a magnesium dependent enzyme that does that conversion. And that enzyme is called delta 60 saturase. It's a fairly well-known enzyme. 
and fatty acid metabolism, certainly. But if you don't have magnesium, that is not going to work. So the, the, the fraction of the population that doesn't get enough magnesium is at risk for not being able to, to convert ALA from plants. What plants is ALA in? It's predominantly in foods like chia, hemp, flax, walnuts, those kinds of foods. The conversions I've seen are between 5 and 15% conversion of ALA to EPA and 2 to 5% conversion to DHA. So if you wanted to get a gram of EPA by eating flax oil, and there's only between 5 and 15%, let's average that out at 10% conversion. That means you have to do 10 times as much ALA. You need 10 grams of ALA to get one gram of EPA from there based on a typical conversion of Americans being able to switch from ALA to EPA in the body. Now, flax oil is only about half ALA. That means you need 20 grams of flax oil to equal about one gram of EPA which you can typically get from two of our strongest capsules today. So it's a, you could take two caps of really strong fish oil concentrates or 20 caps of flax oil and some magnesium, and theoretically you'd end up with about the same amount of EPA and DHA. Just to give you a sense of how dilute these ALA sources are from uh, eating plants and trying to get your omega-3. That's not to say it, it, that it's bad to take flax oil. I take it myself. But I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat fish. I have to convert it. Or I have to take small amounts of algae EPA DHA and rely on the flax oil also converting because I'm taking my magnesium with it. So here's some of that. Those are some of the strategies I'm using. Now, Supplements are safer than fish as far as getting omega-3 because omega-3 is naturally low in things like mercury and, and the industrial type chemicals that are in the waterways because they're filtered and distilled. And because mercury tends to bond to protein in fish rather than to the oil. So when you're separating and pulling the oil out, pressing the oil out, then you're typically keeping the mercury levels at, at fairly low safe levels. Now, according to Medical News Today, DHA, which is the longest chain fatty acid, is the most important one for the brain. It's a structural component of various parts of the brain and the eyes. The eyes are technically associated with brain structures. And the brain is mostly fat, most of the brain's fat is DHA. We need DHA for the brain to be healthy. And this is a, a mouse study, but they're finding memory cells communicate better when DHA levels are higher and that memory improves on a high DHA diet. So you can, by providing what the brain needs, which partially means DHA, then you can make sure that the brain and memory are operating at optimal levels. And mice containing a diet higher in DHA had higher levels of DHA in the brain, especially the hippocampus region, compared with mice fed a regular healthy diet. And it improves the memory of those mice by having the DHA supplementation. Does it work in people? Apparently so. Here's a study from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showing that supplements of DHA improved memory in young women and also improved memory and reaction time in young men. So this is about a, a gram, about two of our strongest DHA capsules a day would be enough to achieve these levels that are matching what's in the studies. Does it work in healthy aging adults? Here's some people 55 and older, and but they were healthy, but they had memory complaints, as, as many of us do as we age. And they took DHA levels for six months. They almost doubled the reduction in errors 
on a test that measures learning and memory compared to placebo. So the higher the DHA level, the better the score on the test. This indicates that if you nourish the brain and give it the nutrients it needs to maintain itself and to function properly, that memory and other functions of the brain should remain normal, should be able to be maintained properly. So we mentioned MCT oil a few minutes ago in the coconut oil section, and it provides pure medium chain triglycerides. It's These kind of formulas are over 99% C8 caprylic acid and C10 capric acid with a tiny bit of typically lauric acid, a fraction of a percent in there. So they're fairly pure source of two fatty acids that are what MCT oil is known for. And you notice it says they're processed like carbs without requiring insulin and without affecting blood sugar level negatively. If you can replace other oils in the diet, especially things like corn oil or soybean oil, those kind of things, this does not require the pancreatic enzymes to break them down and absorb them in the same way that the other vegetable oil, oils do. They're easily absorbed across the wall of the small intestine and directly go to the liver for energy production. And it's difficult for the body to convert these particular fatty acids into body fat. So you're getting this high density calories. Uh, they're not quite nine calories per gram like other fats, but they're around eight calories per gram of the MCT. And you get the, the calories you need for intense workouts or long distance performance or, or anything like that without risking that the excess is going to go into body fat and without putting a strain on your digestive system. So, you know, this is actually a good fat for people who say have had their gallbladders removed and they, they don't have the full mechanism for absorbing fats. MCT oil absorbs so well, it kind of bypasses that whole mechanism and helps absorb and it helps transport fat-soluble nutrients at the same time. So it's also a carrier for things like vitamin D or alpha-lipoic acid or uh, any kind of fat-soluble nutrient you want to take in. It, it can only help that absorb. And it, it because it doesn't require this whole normal digestive strategy, an absorption strategy of pancreatic enzymes and bile salts from the gallbladder, it has a fast transit time, it absorbs very rapidly. And anyone who's on a restricted fat diet, for example, and they're trying to absorb their fat-soluble nutrients, which normally takes about a teaspoon of fat to trigger your bile and your pancreatic enzymes, here's a way to help you absorb those even without triggering those mechanisms that you could try to have fat absorption shortcut. Yet compared to regular vegetable oils like canola oil, MCT oil does not raise serum triglycerides when you take the oil. And this is a fairly high dose and there was a spike in serum triglycerides for canola oil and actually a slight decline in serum triglycerides for those who got the MCT as a substitute for canola oil. And this is a study where it's a double-blind controlled trial. There was a controlled diet, and in the diet they incorporated MCT oil, and this is only about two-thirds of a tablespoon. You know, it's not a huge dose. And there was a significant improvement in the body mass index over an eight to 12 week period in the people taking MCT instead of other fatty acids. Now, an important neurotransmitter in the body is acetylcholine. This is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain and in the nervous system. And the way it works is phosphatidylserine is stimulating the 
production and release of acetylcholine across the synaptic gap, neurotransmitters are like ferries going across a river transporting messages, and acetylcholine is that ferry boat. So it needs a source of choline, it needs an acetyl group, it needs the stimulators, and there's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down acetylcholine and minimizes the amount in the body and sometimes it works too well and, or people aren't making enough of the acetylcholine itself and there's supplements that can inhibit the breakdown and maintain healthy levels of acetylcholine in the body for example huperzine a so alpha gpc is a supplement known to promote the production of acetylcholine because it's providing choline Alpha GPC, the C is choline. Huperzine A helps maintain high acetylcholine levels by preventing the breakdown of existing acetylcholine and helping to maintain healthy levels. And phosphatidylserine, which is a fraction that's more commonly known as part of a very small fraction of lecithin products, actually stimulates the release and facilitates the transmission of acetylcholine across that gap. So alpha GPC is bioavailable from the gut. It passes the blood brain barrier. So the brain has a source of choline to make acetylcholine. Huperzine A, it does again penetrate the blood brain barrier to maintain levels of acetylcholine in the brain. Phosphatidylserine is critical for cell membrane composition. A lot of the lecithin compounds are very important for cell membrane composition. And that's, that's actually a communications media. You have to send signals in and out of that through that membrane. So it facilitates the conduction of electrical impulses in neurons. Uh, these are like electric wires with gaps and you have to bridge the gap to send messages from one nerve to the other. They're not directly connected. And acetylcholine release is stimulated by phosphatidylserine as well as facilitating the, the signal going through the nerve itself. So there's multiple functions of phosphatidylserine in this regard. Another interesting area to look at for brain health is magnesium. And we're going to be talking a little bit about this formula called magtine, which is magnesium L3 and 8. It's a chelated or bonded form of magnesium attached to threonic acid and amino acid. And it delivers magnesium specifically to the nervous system. This is patented, it's soluble, it's bioavailable. Why magnesium for the brain? It helps regulate the neurons, and it's necessary for the neurons to be stable and adaptable. So the brain relies on magnesium for these. It also uses magnesium, by the way, to help regulate excitotoxins, which is a term that refers to aspartic, aspartic acid and glutamic acid and the MSG-type compounds that are overstimulating neurons in some cases. Magnesium is one of the things the body uses to regulate that. So magtine is another way to, to, to say what it is, is a magnesium salt of L-threonic acid. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets in the central nervous system to support the neurons plasticity or adaptability to maintain and preserve already normal, healthy cognitive function. We want to keep what we got as we age. And when they compared magnesium 3 and 8, magtine material, to other magnesium compounds, magnesium chloride, magnesium citrate, magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate, and magnesium gluconate, the bioavailability was higher not only in the body, but getting through the blood-brain barrier because they can measure higher levels in the cerebral sp spinal fluid after supplementation. And 
a lot of people don't think of curcumin for brain function, but there is a role for it there too. And the question that I'm asking here is, does bioavailability equal efficacy? And normally the answer would be yes. Logically and intuitively, the answer would be yes. However, it is not true for curcumin. Let me explain why. First of all, this is an important area. We're looking at about a thousand papers a year published in peer reviewed journals looking at curcumin. This is a huge area of research and a huge area of interest in natural products stores. Why? Because it's a free radical neutralizer. It helps balance immunity and brain function with poor bioavailability. So when you're buying this extract from turmeric roots, normally they're extracting three curcuminoids, which are collectively known as curcumin extract, but is actually 75% curcumin and about 20% other curcumin metabolites or molecules. When you extract curcumin from turmeric, you're taking something that's water soluble and nicely absorbed in the food, you're tearing it out of the matrix that makes it soluble and absorbable, and now you have an insoluble mass of curcumin that doesn't want to go anywhere or do anything. And so all companies have strategies for what to do to increase its bioavailability. That doesn't always work as thoughts, though. And one way to look at this is you can orally take eight grams, which is about 16 capsules, and you can't detect any free curcumin levels, the active form in human serum in, in our bloodstream. If you go up to 10 to 12 grams, which is 20 to 24 capsules typically, sometimes you'll find very low levels. It is not well absorbed because they've torn it out of its absorbable matrix in, in the spice, turmeric, and they, they've ruined that part of it and have to try to compensate somehow. So what do they do? They try to get a, a dispersed or a soluble form, and they improve bioavailability by using solvents and dispersants. Some of them are gonna be natural like MCT oil, some of them are going to be synthetic, like polysorbate 80. Some of them are going to be fat soluble, and some of them are going to be water soluble. Some people will use nanotechnology or other chemical means to try to force absorption, which is not always good. The body doesn't always like what, it's, what you're using to make it more absorbable. So, in fact, the most absorbable form of curcumin has no effect on inflammatory markers. Think, why are people taking curcumin? Maybe they're doing some exercise and they have some muscle stress or, or joint pain on a, because of being a weekend warrior or working out or something, doing yard work, and they have a temporary ache and pain they want to deal with. They're, they're taking curcumin like a remedy in that case for the short-term benefit. And if you're taking it and it's not giving you the remedy, what's the point? So this is a little technical, but there's three bioavailability problems. One is it's rapidly glucuronidated and eliminated. Glucuronidate means liver detox. The liver says, I don't like what this is attached to. It's going, I'm dumping it as quick as it goes in. Instability in hydrolysis, it tends to break down in the gut and entrant it to the liver and in the liver. So it does not tend to last very long. And it has a limited solubility and absorption, as I mentioned earlier. So you have something that doesn't absorb well, it's breaking down on the way to the liver. And the liver is saying, ew, what is this junk it's attached to and dumping it as quickly as it goes in in some cases. So these are problems that are known and it affects different combinations of curcumin with their strategies to solubilize them in different ways. 
at different levels. The point is free curcumin, it is not conjugated or attached to anything else, is the desirable one. It's the one the liver is not trying to get rid of. It's the one that, that is going to have the health benefits in the body. And it's the only form that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So just a little slide here showing what happens with glucuronidation. It's a phase two liver detox. And I like to explain liver detox in this way. Phase one liver detox tends to make things water soluble so it can be carried, you're dumping something. You wanna transport it through the bloodstream to the kidneys and out through the urine without causing problems, without being reactive or effective Two different ways to look at it, but not but having it be inert and locked up and unable to do anything on its way out. Think of transporting a prisoner from a jail to a courtroom on a paddy wagon. You're essentially turning the with glucuronidation, you're forming a paddy wagon to take this water soluble thing that is now more reactive and more dangerous than ever. Phase one liver detox might make something actually more dangerous until phase two detox comes and, and secures it for transport safely out of the body. So this happens with drugs. This happens with toxins produced in the body. This happens with polysorbate 80, for example, if it's attached to a molecule like curcumin or CoQ10 or ubiquinol to try to force absorption. The body doesn't like these chemical detergents and dumps them pretty quickly. So when we're measuring curcumin in the body, there's different ways to measure. Simple absorption, how much absorbed. That's what a lot of the companies are using. It is very potentially misleading because if you're measuring something that's not going to be effective, that the body doesn't like, then it's not going to give you any benefit. So simple absorption is a numbers game that is going to backfire if you play it. Don't play the numbers game. Look at tissue distribution. Look at functional measurements. What are functional measurements? What does it do for your walking distance, your flexibility, your pain scores, the things that you're trying to overcome that you've overdone something this week or this weekend? and you want to take something to help minimize that. that. That's really why people are using this. So when I look at studies, I see if glucuronidase enzyme was used to prepare the samples. Are they tearing apart ineffective metabolites or are they measuring the, the actual amount absorbed? But I really don't care. As a clinical nutritionist, I don't care how much absorbed. I care what benefit somebody is gonna get from, the, from a product. What is the potential benefit to that person? And so are they able to go to work the next day? Are they able to function properly and have minimal aches and pains because of overdoing it this weekend? You know, that, that's really more of a function I would look for as a benefit rather than X number of times absorption versus something else well, show me how well these things work. Don't show me how well they absorbed. We know absorption, in this case, can be misleading. So relative efficacy in humans for joint health, brain benefits, muscle recovery, those are the kind of things we really want to look at. So here comes this long Vita material from UCLA, and it's in a product we call Curcu Brain. And it's a special kind of curcumin. These researchers have actually developed what they call a solid lipid curcumin particle. So you can absorb and circulate free curcumin. It has not been glucuronidated by the liver. It has not been changed and made ineffective by the liver on its way to dump, being dumped from the body. This diagram kind of shows it a little better. You form basically a liposome type product. 
that is releasing from the liposome at the optimal point of absorption for curcumin in the small intestine, where it crosses the blood and tissue barrier and is able to circulate as free curcumin. You've protected it from stomach acid, you've helped it absorb, you've released it into the proper form that's gonna give you the biggest bang for the buck. Compare it to the 95% curcuminoid product, it's 65 times better bioavailability, which means you could take a, a whole lot less and still get benefits, and you actually get better benefits. This is a human study. They are not using glucuronidase to tear apart inactive metabolites and measure them too. This is actually measuring what's in the bloodstream, which increases the half-life dramatically from about an hour or two to about seven hours, and it gives you a lot more free curcumin, which is really the most effective form in the body. Free curcumin will cross the blood-brain barrier. Glucuronidated ones that have been treated by the liver will not. So when they're tearing apart metabolites and looking at, look how much absorbed, even though we're not looking at it, it actually having a benefit, one of the things it's not going to benefit is crossing the blood-brain barrier and providing curcumin in the brain. Does this form of curcumin work on other issues. Uh, for example, here's people with healthy levels of inflammation. It's still reducing inflammatory markers in those people, which means it's able to control that, which is a normal healthy bodily function, controlling levels of inflammation within a normal range. But free curcumin will cross the blood-brain barrier It'll protect the brain tissue from free radical effect and support our cognitive function. It will reduce the undesirable beta amyloid protein in healthy adults. Again, these are not disease individuals. These are healthy adults. So it can regulate these proteins, regulate oxidative stress in, in the brain, and regulate short-term inflammatory and immune challenges uh, due to environmental or other issues, including physical exertion. This is looking at inflammatory and muscle damage markers in healthy subjects, again. Inflammatory marker in, this, in those kind of subjects. Uh, again, inflammatory markers. Uh, people who are working out and they have inflammatory and muscle damage biomarkers, which is normal, can actually reduce them uh, which is desirable. The body is supposed to be able to do this. So we're looking at over a dozen studies showing low dose improving working memory and attention in a month. It's permeable, it's soluble, it's stable form, it's stability through stomach acid and digestion. And another product of note, brain attention. This is interesting because this is one that's been tested in children. And we have few products that are really useful for children. It's a natural chocolate flavored chewable tablet and it helps with attention and memory. What is it? This is kind of a Korean folk memory where they dissolve or break apart, digest silkworm cocoons to get the protein. and they have this specific protein that's a trademark ingredient called Sera-Q, C-E-R-A-Q, that crosses the blood-brain barrier, binds to proteins in the brain, and helps normalize brain structures. So one theory is that these peptides, these short chains of amino acid sequences, form a ribbon-like structure called a beta sheet, which helps to hold the brain together and, and help it function properly. It interacts with brain peptides to maintain their normal functions and helps maintain healthy acetylcholine levels in the brain. This is what the formula looks like. We use organic sweetener, organic cocoa, organic gum acacia in here. And it's been tested in children seven years old and up. 
So let, let's look at some amino acids for brain, memory, mood. They're all somewhat connected. Here's a few of the aminos, 5-HTP, acetyl-L-carnitine, GABA, L-theanine, L-tryptophan, L-tyrosine, and taurine. You notice GABA and taurine don't have Ls because there's no optical rotation. There's not two forms like L and D or DL forms. It just has one form. 5-HTP is a metabolite. When you take dietary tryptophan or supplemental tryptophan, about 10% of it goes into the serotonin pathway by converting to 5-HTP. This is extracted from a bean. And serotonin is known to be a neurotransmitter for positive mood and relaxation. Acetyl-L-carnitine will cross the blood-brain barrier. It's a free radical fighter, helps with energy metabolism and brain function. And it's something that People who are vegan and are not eating meat, because carna is the same root as carnivore, which means meat eaters. Uh, if you're not eating meat, you might not have a lot of carnitine to make acetylcarnitine in your body. So supplementing might be a strategy. Also, people who are looking simply for a, a brain nutrient. The acetyl group here is used to make acetylcholine. So if you're getting choline from one source and the acetyl group from another, your body has what it needs to make acetylcholine. Now, GABA is a non-essential amino acid. You can produce it in the brain from other amino acids like glutamic acid, for example. It's a neurotransmitter that regulates the brain and nerve activity. It limits and inhibits the number of neurons firing, which helps calm the brain and promotes relaxation and helping to control nervous tension. So the GABA is something naturally produced in the brain and you could supplement. If you supplement and it works, it's crossing the blood-brain barrier. So that's interesting to note. Uh, it's, it's only typically gonna work in the brain. So you want it to cross the blood-brain barrier because that's where you're gonna feel the effect. Now L-theanine, is an amino acid found in green tea. It's one of the reasons, theoretically, why having the caffeine in green tea is not as stimulating to the body. It doesn't have as many side effects, potentially, as drinking coffee, which also contains caffeine. So it promotes relaxation, even though you're taking a caffeine source, without causing drowsiness, so it helps to focus. It might be a good thing if you're taking tests or something to uh, drink green tea, like college students, for example. It's considered a free radical fighter in helping with cardiovascular function. This is an interesting study that uh, a 250 milligram dose of caffeine, which is about equivalent to two cups of coffee, the amount of caffeine, that if they took a dose of 200 milligrams of theanine, it was able to negate the negative effect of caffeine on blood pressure. Caffeine is known to raise blood pressure by restricting arterial flow, by constricting arteries. And if theanine relaxes them, then you're not gonna have necessarily a rise in blood pressure from drinking a bunch of caffeine. So, you know, obviously there's limits to that. I'm not going to suggest that uh, drink all the ca coffee you want and a little bit of theanine is going to counteract it. But certainly you drink a, a large cup of coffee and have some theanine, it might have some benefit. L-tryptophan, this is an essential amino acid. You have to get it from the diet or supplements. Uh, if it's produced in a supplement, you, the product has to be tested for peak E and microbial contamination. Tryptophan is a precursor of serotonin, as I mentioned earlier, with 5-HTP. And serotonin is a precursor of melatonin, which is known as the sleep hormone. So it regulates mood, stress response, and helps with restful sleep. L-tyrosine is a non-essential amino acid that supports mental alertness. Production of neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, and stress response, 
healthy thyroid function, healthy skin pigments. There's a bunch of things tyrosine does, but it's more alert related. So it's something you tend to take earlier in the day, whereas tryptophan, 5-HTP, the GABA, theanine are more relaxing and would tend to be taken typically later in the day. Taurine's another relaxing amino acid. Uh, also, it tends to be something that's healthy for the heart to get taurine as well. And we have a couple formulas. True Focus is one that promotes positive mood. It's got tyrosine, phenylalanine, taurine in there. It's got some cofactors. And phenylalanine and tyrosine are the main precursors for these neurotransmitters, which requires vitamins C and B6, which are also in the formula. So they help maintain alertness, mental acuity, and a feeling of well-being. Next section, we're going to look at the gut-brain connection. I have a few slides on this. The digestive tract and the brain are connected directly through the nervous system by the vagus nerve. They are communicating. The gut microbes are releasing neurotransmitters and uh, as well as hormones and, and other things that are communicating throughout the body, including signals to the brain. The gut is often called the second brain because it's making and utilizing neurotransmitters. And in the New York Times a few years ago, they asked if the bacteria in the gut can explain our mood. And in a randomized trial, people who took multi-species probiotics for four weeks significantly reduced their sad mood. And looking at what's happening in the gut seems to have a similar impact on the central nervous system. And as one example, this is a mouse study. If there's a mouse that's stressed during pregnancy, their babies have fewer lactobacilli probiotics, which are known to release GABA. We mentioned GABA earlier as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which helps calm nervous activity. So if the mother's stressed, the babies have less of this probiotic that makes GABA, and then the babies have less GABA. If the mother's stressed, the baby's going to be stressed. Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? So there's a bi-directional communication of the gut-brain axis through the vagus nerve and through hormones. So that concludes my review of nutritional support for the aging brain. I did not mention every thing that's used for the brain. Obviously, there's things like ginkgo biloba that helps help with circulation and other things. I wanted to talk a little more about things that were not as well known and a little more uh, up to date, perhaps, in terms of what is useful and what people might not immediately think of as brain nutrients, like, like the amino acids or curcumin or things like that, uh, bringing those into the conversation. So with that, we're going to turn this back to Sue, and I thank you.